Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the GG Dispatch. I am Jeremy. I'm Alan. And today we have a fresh batch of video game news for all of you. Uh, what's been happening in the video game world? And to start off, we have a very pretty packed episode. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started with uh, the breaking news from today, which is the fact that Bungie is going to be is is currently in the process of laying off an undetermined number of staff. Um, we uh, began to see, I actually started to see some uh, murmurings about this on LinkedIn of all places. Uh, and Jason Schreier uh, shortly followed up with um, a tweet uh, where he said, uh, Bungie laid off an undisclosed number of staff today, part of ongoing job cuts across PlayStation. The company recently delayed the upcoming Destiny 2 expansion, the final shape, to June 2024, and the new game Marathon to 2025. Um, and so uh, it's funny because like on that thread, people are like, they didn't tell us that they were going to delay these games. And he's like, yeah, I'm literally breaking the news. I'm reporting it now. And a few of the folks who were responding were like, well, can you unreport it, please? Um, so I thought that was pretty funny. Um, but yeah, it's uh, pretty crazy because Sony had invested over a billion dollars for staff retention uh, when they acquired Bungie. And yet, we're still seeing these layoffs happening um, on a property that, you know, you know, destiny isn't the biggest property out there for sure, but it's still usually seen as a model of success, especially with, with games as a service. Um, and for that company to be going into layoffs, um, it's sort of reflective of maybe some organizational struggle. So I don't know. What, what are your thoughts on this, Alan? Uh, I think it is wild that they spent that much money on supposedly to to retain staff, and now they're laying them off. And then they delayed uh, the final shape along with Marathon. So if you're delaying those, does that mean you kind of need more staff to kind of like get there? Or you know, what does that mean for everyone else there at Bungie? And this is also remember coming off the back of them laying off people at Media Molecule. So it, it, yeah. it really you start to question what exactly is going on at Sony because they haven't exactly struggled this generation. The PS5 is doing extremely well. Yeah. You see the sales numbers that Spider-Man 2 has put up. And you also know that they've done really well in terms of their PlayStation Plus subscription, like the extra and premium. They're boasting those numbers uh, a little while ago. So what exactly is going on? Why, why do they all of a sudden you start laying off all these people? It doesn't make any sense. Something doesn't feel right. Yeah. And there's definitely been some some chatter about the the broader strategy. I mean, just going back to the fact that they're delaying the final shape for for Destiny. I mean, um, they recently released, I think, which of the season uh, or season of the Witch and the Dawning um, uh, content or, or raid for Destiny Two. But you know, a lot of Destiny veterans have basically said that that's going to get cleared very soon, and and so you know, probably within a month or two, and so. Uh, the the vast majority of Destiny 2 players are basically looking at a six-month drought of content, which, again, if you're looking at a game as a service, you, you cannot go that long without new content. It's 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 equivalent to a death sentence in, in a lot of ways. And so um, I'm really interested to see if they have any alternative plans for content for the players in the meantime. But... Of course, and of course, beyond that, right? Like we have to think about the the lives impacted by these layoffs. Uh, again, you know, we we've only had our show for a very short amount of time, and yet I feel like we've reported on layoffs in one sense, one way or another, in every single one of these episodes already. And so, it's really unfortunate that in a in a market like this, such talented developers and and uh, staff are essentially being kind of tossed out into the cold currently, uh, especially from a studio as, as 
well renowned uh, as as Bungie. So really unfortunate. Yeah, it's absolutely brutal, and it'll it's just really interesting to see that Bungie's brought in as sort of like this expert in games as a service, and like now they're the ones going through all these layoffs. So you know, you wonder with the departure of uh, Jim Ryan earlier this year, if maybe they've changed their mind about that and maybe also seeing just how a lot of other games and servers are struggling, including Fortnite. Um, so yeah. it's, it's, it's going to be interesting times ahead for, for Sony. Yeah. Uh, just one last thing on this. Cause you, you reminded me, I mean, the, the last of us multiplayer was, was on, you know, in route, right? Like it was in flight. And then um, Naughty Dog had Bungie come and do a consult consultation. And it was literally the consultation from Bungie that made them effectively put it on ice. And, yeah, you, yeah, know, yeah. you know, Greg Miller at, at kind of funny has said like, it's dead. <laughs> you know, It's like in the basket. Nobody's willing to say it yet, but like, that's his bet. And I'm feeling more like that, that might be the case. Um, but again, it's just very ironic that a studio that like Bungie that can effectively take one of, if not the most iconic PlayStation studios and make them shelf a highly anticipated game is now going through this sort of professional struggle, right? Like it's, it's really, really interesting to think about. Um, so anyways, um, unfortunate news, wishing, wishing a speedy recovery for all those impacted by the layoffs and looking forward to, uh, what, what Bungie has for us next. Hopefully Sony can, can get their ish together. Next up on the list, uh, Microsoft, uh, blocking unauthorized controllers and accessories. Uh, so toss out those mad cats controllers y'all <laughs> because Microsoft will not stand for it. Um, users of affected accessories are beginning to see error messages on their device and essentially they're being given a two week grace period. Um, and so you'll get a message and it says that you can only use this device for two more weeks. And then following those two weeks, it will no longer work with the system uh, at all. It's designed to target controllers that like help players cheat or otherwise can, you know, affect the system in a negative way, supposedly. Um, and this also comes shortly after the news that uh, the PS5, the new slim model with a separate disk drive is going to require an internet connection to validate the external disk drive. So um, this is definitely kind of leaning into the territory of like micromanagement, right? When it comes to like various peripherals and accessories. And so uh, I'm just curious, you know, what, what your thoughts are on this? I have a theory. Uh, so obviously recently Microsoft has acquired Activision and what comes with that? Call of Duty. And cheating has been a big issue in that in that community to the point where a lot of people have been kind of pushed out and stopped playing because of, like the, the the cheating is just so rampant. So I wonder if this was a move on Microsoft's part, like okay, Call of Duty is ours now, which means this is also our problem. So mm. let's just get ahead of it and try to squash this. Uh, and also, you know, you don't want people to think like, oh man, I'm just gonna run to cheaters if I play this. It's not gonna be fun. That's the last thing that they want. Right. So I, I think that that's probably the play here of trying to like really lock it down. Now, I don't know how effective that will actually be. Like I'm not, an, uh, I don't know enough, uh, to be able to say, yeah, this is going to work. Like I don't know if you can still buy an authorized controller and like do some mods to it or whatever and keep cheating. Like I just don't know that much. Right. Yeah. And that, I mean, honestly, I think you've got a good theory there. I, I think, um, and I don't, again, I, I also am not super familiar with all that can be done in terms of modding controllers and how it can, uh, especially third-party controllers and how it might uh, impact gameplay. Um, but I could definitely see it as one of a handful of steps that Microsoft might take to safeguard that experience for Activision um, and Call of Duty players. So uh, I will... I will take that theory uh, and use it to assuage the otherwise annoyance, uh, the, <laughs> the annoyance that I otherwise would have for this news. Um, but uh, yeah, I definitely think that's, that's interesting. Si uh, similarly with the external disk drive for PlayStation, I think, you know, the, the internet, uh, internet validation, it's, it's, I think people initially thought that it was on every use, but it's just during setup. And I think, again, it's to ensure that, it's the uh, the proper hardware so that, you know, they're not doing 
not doing shady stuff and not, uh, you know, violating whatever the terms of terms of use are for the PlayStation, which nobody reads, but probably is, is, uh, you know, enslaving us to some fey entity for millennia if we use the wrong controller. Um, no, yeah, um, for sure. That's just like <laughs> straight up VRM. And like you said, it's just on the first, uh, the first go around, which is not surprising me at all. Cause I think they, they kind of do that now with, uh, the, uh, original PlayStation. Like it's just paired at the factory. Because I think that it's been an issue where uh, repair folks are like, hey, you know, so basically if that drive goes bad, like, you've got to throw the whole console out. Cause you, or have it as a digital-only console because you can't really yeah. go and have, you know, have it repair or Sony won't just do that for you. Hmm. Um, and I think that I know that a lot of preservationists were like, oh, you know, what does this mean for in 2035 or whatever? But I think that uh, time has shown that at the end of the day, hackers will win out. Like once Sony moves on to the PS6 and they kind of just leave the PS5 alone and doesn't get any updates, like some will find some sort of workaround to be able to get past that and, and let people use, uh, you know, disk drives and add them onto those PS5s. Yeah, definitely. All right. Um, next up, uh, Five Nights at Freddy's has a huge box office launch, like, way bigger than you would expect for a bunch of animatronic uh animals and uh in a creepy uh setting so um it grossed 80 million dollars domestically and uh 52.6 million internationally for over 130 million dollars opening weekend uh that's crazy (laughs) so um it is uh you know i'm i'm not a parent myself i've got some nephews and nieces but um it is apparently an extremely popular intellectual property with kids. Uh, it's sort of like the, uh, you know, are you scared of the dark goosebumps style uh, narrative that, that a lot of kids who enjoy the creepy and the spooky cling to. And so um, that paired with a PG 13 rating, as opposed to an R rating, I think helped to get parents to, to grab, you know, their, their, you know, nine, 10, 12 year old kids uh, and bring them to the theater to enjoy uh, to enjoy this movie. Um, and of course it's Halloween tomorrow. And so perfect, perfect season, perfect storm, uh, for them to enjoy it. Um, and it's, it's funny cause if you go on Rotten Tomatoes, the critics absolutely hated the movie. They got, they just panned yeah. it all to hell. Uh, <laughs> it has like a 26% or something, but yeah, the yeah. audience scores are like 85, 87 or higher. So I think, you know, definitely the it met its audience where they were. No, one hundred percent. I was going to bring that up too as you were talking. I was like, on Ron to me, I think got like destroyed by critics. But like, it's just it definitely feels like one of those movies where the critics absolutely hate it, but then the fan base loves it. Like, they they understood the assignment and they got it, and everyone and, and they're being rewarded with that with the high scores. Although I do wonder like how much someone who doesn't like that IP at all would enjoy it. Yeah, I I don't know. I, you know, I've seen things from the game and I, I never really got into it myself, but I don't know if I'm motivated enough to go check it out. I, and besides, I have to go spend three and a half hours in the theater watching Scorsese's Killers of the Flower Moon. So uh, oh. my my, <laughs> my my movie calendar is kind of booked up. Um, and then I have to... It is on Peacock. It. <laughs> it, is on, it is on Peacock. You can just stream it. You don't have to go to the theater to... Oh, to okay. Well, you know, I have to I have to sit there and I have to have Nicole Kidman tell me that that you know amc makes movies better and stuff it really helps to oh, yeah. complete the whole experience <laughs> welcome you to tr- welcoming you to true cinema indeed indeed peak cinema if you will um ps plus pricing defended by a sony executive surprise surprise so uh there was a recent interview with Eric Lempel, Senior Vice President and Head of Global Marketing at Sony, uh, where he defended the increase, uh, recent increases for PS Plus, uh, sometime, you know, for some of the plans up to 30%. Um, and he said, uh, first he said that the price hadn't increased for many years. So, you know, they're playing catch up uh, right off the bat. I don't necessarily agree with that strategy. I think, you know, um, you don't you don't wait six years and then have a huge jump. I think there could have been a way to to ramp that a little bit more strategically. Um, but then also he mentioned that a lot of customers have recognized there's a lot of value in the PS5, and we have to look at our pricing and adjust to market conditions. Um, now, 
a few months ago, they stopped reporting PlayStation Plus subscriber numbers as well. And this was after uh, their subscriber numbers had dropped uh, when last reported in early 2023 compared to last year. Um, and then they increased their pricing. And so I'm not entirely sure that would help. And here we are. So, um, you know, Alan, you and I have talked a bit about the value of Game Pass and, and kind of feeling like this will likely become a much more hotly contested competition in the coming weeks, months, years. Uh, where do you see, you know, where do you see this going? Like, you know, in terms of how PlayStation plus can, can attempt to, you know, build the case for its value. Do you think it, they will try to do this? Like what, what are you thinking in terms of the game pass and, and PS plus matchup? I'm thinking that Sony right now, like that exec is out of his mind because, you know, he can say all he wants about, oh, we haven't raised prices and everything and how much value we're delivering. But like when you compare to Game Pass where you're getting those first party titles day and date, Sony just doesn't do it at all. Like right now I can go on PS Plus Extra, which is I am a member of, yeah. and I can play Miles of Morales, but I can't play like the first one and I can't play the second one. So where's the value there? Um, I think that a being counter at Sony was like, hey, we can jack it up X amount of percent. I think that we will only lose X amount of people who will just downgrade to the uh, PlayStation like base plan. Mm -hmm. um, and the ones who stay will make up for it in terms of how much money we're making. Right. Uh, I, and, and I don't know how, if they'll be able to sustain that without starting to offer some of those first party titles, at least a little bit quicker, if not on day and date the way uh, Xbox does. Yeah, and that's I don't know. I I feel like it's it's going to require a bit of a hard lesson and and the and the kind of tricky thing is that we won't really see that as consumers, right? Like I think what'll happen is they're going to see their subscriber count decrease or they're going to see folks fall back to a lower tier like I did. That's exactly what I did. I used to have like the uppermost like premium tier and I dropped down one tier because I don't want the PS classics anymore and it's not worth the extra money anymore for me. Um, but, you know, they're, so they're going to do some internal math and, and that sort of thing. And then maybe they'll make some choices in terms of offering a bit more value either to the premium tier to bring more people back up to that level or, to the mid tier to make sure people are, are, you know, solidly invested in their, in their service. But we're not going to be able to see around any corners or like really get any forecasting into that because they're going to keep it all internal. That's part of the reason why I think they stopped reporting the PS plus subscriber numbers, because if they still were reporting those numbers, then we would see like in three months or six months, Oh, their subscriber numbers dropped by like 3 million people on Twitter would be doing the math, right? Like, oh, they're losing a lot of money now. And then, you know, we could begin to plan for, prepare for some adjustments and strategy to deliver more value to the customer. This way, <clears throat> Sony gets to keep all the cards. Um, so I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll see the value because I think people are starting to pay more attention to game pass. I think the day and date releases for first party is a big deal. Uh, and Sony definitely has some opportunity there. And so I'm hoping that that plus subscriber drop will equal, you know, um, some more competition in this space. I do have a theory. I, I have another theory. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, I'll, I'm listening. Uh, PlayStation has not been afraid to discount these subscription services like xbox you will you will never see them discounted like on uh when you boot up your xbox or pc you're never going to see that they typically have to wait for like a target or a best buy or something to give a small discount uh but the last time when i signed up it was like a 30 percent discount sounds familiar that's like the 30 percent they just hiked it so i feel like we'll probably see more of those discounts coming throughout the year but they still kind of keep being able to make the same amount of money. So like, I think the extra went from like 99 to 130 a year. So before, uh, when they would discount it, you get it for like 66, $67. But now they can go, Oh, Hey, you're getting a great deal, man. You're getting discounted and you're paying 99, which is what it used to cost. Um, so I think that 
discounts will be a key part of kind of getting people to subscribe a little bit more and, and not lose as many uh, people. Uh, also, uh, if you're new to our show, on the episode when I talked about sort of the way that I kind of get Game Pass Ultimate on a cheaper uh, pricing, and I do the same thing for extra. You know, when you feel Costco sales, combine yeah. it with that uh, discount what Sony gives it to you, and then you'll end up getting a decent deal. Yeah, for sure. Um, I, I like that idea as well. I think, you know, the the utilizing the discount always makes people feel like they're they're saving money, right? Like uh I, I think it was on this show where we we're talking about like gamer math, right? Like um, you know, you if if they throw in free shipping, right? Like if you spend fifty dollars, you get free shipping. And so you're like, oh well, I'm at thirty dollars. If I spend an extra twenty dollars, I'm basically making money because I get free shipping, right? So yeah, uh, yeah, I yeah. think I, I think the uh the discount approach will definitely be um definitely be impactful and and get folks to maybe get back on those tiers that they're used to for sure all right last story uh city skylines optimization is god awful so uh this was an article from uh this is an article from pc games and uh and essentially they talk about how uh, City Skylines 2 is a bloodbath for graphics cards, with Gamers Nexus calling it one of the worst optimized games we've ever tested. Um, so it's definitely, you know, this game came out, I believe, last week. It came out uh, to Game Pass and everything. Um, and it was designed to be an intricate, intuitive, and ambitious city builder. Uh, you know, it, it got some decent reviews, but when reviewing the GPU benchmarks, it was pretty terrible. Um, <laughs> so, you know, there there was one example where the NVIDIA GeForce uh, RTX 4060 gets about 28.7 frames per second on average at 1080p. Um, and... Uh, medium you know, settings, too. Not even high. Settings. Those are medium settings. <laughs> yeah. And so, like, essentially they said, you know, you could have forked out 400 or more on a current gen graphics card, but still not manage 30 frames per second at 1080p in City Skylines 2. <laughs> so um, it's pretty awful. I mean, we, we've talked to, on a couple of the shows already about like kind of the PC game experience. And so I, I do want to start by saying I can sympathize with folks who are trying to optimize the games and trying to bring these titles to PC and deliver a seamless experience to, for all manners of hardware. But like, how do you, you know, like, how do you get there? Right. Like how, how can you ensure that you're delivering that kind of experience for, for everyone? I, it seems like it's, it's getting harder and harder by the year. Yeah. But I think this one is very much, this needed more time in the oven. And I think the sort of, red flag that should have tipped us off to that was having that xbox version kick to like march of 2024 which is a solid five oh or right five yeah from here. that's right and yeah. i think that uh it got to a point where they're like we got to just put it out because it's a lot of these games it's like we got to get revenue coming in even if people are upset with us uh there'll be our, our diehards who will kind of just deal with putting up with this um, I think that a better option for them would have been early access, but I don't know if being on Game Pass, they could have really done that. Maybe contractually speaking, they might have had to just do what they did now and just put it on Game Pass and yeah. have this be sort of their early access, uh, which is unfortunate because, you know, that's, it, it looks like a really solid game, but the performance is so bad. Like I downloaded it, but I'm just going to wait. I'm not going to, I only have an RTX 2060. So. I, I, you know, my, my car can get absolutely shredded. I'm going to play, play like um, the lowest of the low settings and it's not fun at that point. So, uh, I, it, I hope that they're able to recover and kind of keep improving as time goes on. But for sure, that whole delay of like, oh, first PC and then Xbox like five months from now, that was kind of like, okay, we should have kind of seen this coming. Um, but it, it's bad. And I think that this one especially is just sort of one of those. It's not like, oh, we're pushing the boundaries of technology with like sort of like Alan Wake with all everything it is with lighting and ray tracing and all that stuff. It's just yeah. very much this wasn't ready anywhere near ready, but we just got to put it out. Yeah. 
Exactly. They're, they're not, I mean, it, it, there's definitely some detail in the, in the micro in terms of like the city that you're laying out and everything else, but they're not delivering the immersive experience that Alan Wake 2 um, is being lauded for for delivering. So um, they, they don't really have that excuse to fall back on. So, um, And speaking of which, uh, well, we'll take us into our, our final section here on upcoming and new releases. And so uh, one of the biggest from this past few days was Alan Wake 2, which has been released to some stellar reviews. Um, another, another uh, just absolutely... Uh, strong contender for game of the year if you can believe it like i think that makes you know 12 <laughs> games this year that that are lined up for a game of the year um it, this year is nuts man it's absolutely nuts it's been crazy and so yeah i only two very well reviewed um i'm gonna see if i can work up the courage to play it because as i've mentioned before i'm a tremendous coward when it comes to horror games but i am uh i am really interested because i've heard really good things and i really enjoyed control um so We'll see. Uh, but there was Alan Wake 2. And then uh, coming this week, we've got Star Ocean Second Story Remake, uh, which was one of my favorites uh, when I was a younger lad uh, for the original PlayStation. Um, and so I'm really glad to see it getting that HD 2D treatment. The I got to play a demo of it at PAX, uh, you know, a couple months ago. And it's just absolutely lush, and I am looking forward to providing my review for it very soon. Um, this one, um, so this uh, Star Ocean game, it feels like it's kind of sneaking up on us. Like it's getting lost in the shuffle of everything else going on because, like, I I forgot this thing was even coming out. Like, yeah, it's it's like it's where's the marketing for this? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's mostly on Twitter. <laughs> a lot of the marketing <laughs> is on Twitter right now. Like, you know, I'm seeing a lot of threads and a lot of things getting boosted around it. So, um, but we'll see how it performs. I mean, the core game is fantastic. And so I'm really looking forward to uh, seeing how how it's been uh, brought into a new new age with uh, some additional, uh, maybe some additional features. And also, uh, I think there's a new summoning um uh, items or, or something like that or mechanic built in where you can summon in and use uh, characters from some of the other Star Ocean games like First Departure, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So that'll be interesting to see. And then we've got Persona 5 Tactica, which is arriving in a couple weeks. Uh, one of the day and date releases for Game Pass. So if you are a fan of Atlas's uh, Persona series, specifically Persona 5, uh, we've got a new a tactical RPG approach to the game, and it looks really fun. So um, I will probably be losing some time to that game when it arrives on November 17th. Uh, anything else that, that you're looking forward to, Alan, in terms of uh, games around the corner? Uh, no, mostly Persona 5, tactic, honestly. Uh, I, I loved uh, Persona 5. Like I, play, I put in, I think, almost 100 hours in that. Um, I'm interested to see because I'm not necessarily like a into the genre, the sort of the tactics genre. Um, yeah. So I, I'm I'm interested to see like how they kind of mesh Persona Five with that genre, and if it gets my attention. And the cool part is it's on Game Pass, so if I don't like it, I can just delete it. Yeah, <laughs> just move on to the next thing. Exactly. Yeah. I'm a huge I'm a huge sucker for tactical games. I love Final Fantasy Tactics, Disgaea, Triangle Story, like all those kinds of games are 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 up my alley. So I'm, I'm looking forward to digging into it for sure. Um, and with that, those are all of our uh, headlines for this week. Uh, I want to thank all of you who are tuning in to listen to our, our little video game news show week after week, and just encourage you to check out the geekly grind for all of your geekly needs. We cover all manners of geek content, anime, manga, uh, video games, uh, tabletop games, Anything you can imagine, we've got content on it on the site. And so swing by the Geekly Grind to check it out. Otherwise, look forward to our next episode next Tuesday, bright and early, uh, for your next issue of the GG Dispatch. So until next time, I'm Jeremy. I'm Alan. Keep gaming. <laughs>